I'm ready. To, I'm good to start. Okay, then. So I know that we have a quite a mixed audience. So I try to keep this wide enough so it could interest a variety of people. So I know some people of you here are already working on the IoT, but for those who aren't, so when we, I know we've all heard this world, IoT, it's a big buzzword, it was very popular three years ago. It's, we're kind of losing it now to cyber physical systems, but effectively, what is it? So everything is a thing. So you would expect the internet of things is everything. Well, yes, but when we do research in this area, we normally focus on a subset of these things. Uh, in practice, we most refer to these kind of things, things that are highly specialized, such as cameras, cars, robot arms, specific sensors, things that weren't originally designed to be a multi-purpose computer, but rather some things that uh, are now connected to the internet are definitely part now of larger networks, but have some constraints. So these systems are highly heterogeneous, meaning they're composed of several different components. There might be a mix, for example, a smart factory might have a mixture of sensors, machinery for building things, assembly devices, cameras, cloud servers, all to process data, all connected together in unison. So they are also meant for very specific purpose. So uh, Robot arm was never defined to become a server, was never intended to send data across our thing, it was intended to build things. So there are some security vulnerabilities and outcome of that because they're not meant to be secure or there's no way to secure them. There's a general consensus that they have constraining capabilities. This is quite, um, this is a difficult argument. At the beginning, we mainly refer to things such as wireless sensor networks. So in that case, the devices themselves couldn't perform the computation intensive tasks. When we're referring to cars and these kind of newer internet of things, that gap blurs a little bit, but the constraints change from not being able to process things to maybe not being able to implement the security just because of bespoke IP. And they're often non-adaptable. So it's very hard to, a camera was designed to be a camera, it's meant to take videos. That camera will, un it's unlikely for it to change into a computing thing device, even though it's now connected to the internet and needs to do some other thing from, from security. So this is a general introduction of the kind of IoT I'll be looking at. I know it's up for argument for a lot of people, but this covers most of the cases. Now, why, when we do security for IoT, we want to be able to defend these systems. Uh, one of the things I observed when I was working on this area and when I was talking to some industrial partners is that it's very difficult to update these devices. This might be for a variety of reasons, uh, either the software is bespoke or the device itself doesn't have a way to perform updates. Um, there's a whole area of research on firmware updates for IoT devices, but I'm not going to get into that. Effectively, though, what it means is that for a variety of reasons, we cannot apply security updates directly on the device like we would on more traditional systems. So we're a bit restricted and one way to bypass this restriction, and I'm not by, by no way saying this is the only way of doing things, this is just the area that I investigated as of interest, uh, we decided to go, okay, can we then secure this externally? This means we don't touch the device, we can still protect it from attacks and we don't break any IP or whatever thing that might be unique to the device. Okay, so that made sense. We wanted to use an external monitor instead of a device. So how do we do that? So when we do so, we mainly, whilst there are options such as firewalls and things like that, we mostly are talking about intrusion detection systems. So before I go into the option of intrusion detection system, for those not aware, an intrusion detection system is effectively a monitor placed on the device or a network that given input data detects whether it's an attack or a positive thing. If it's an attack, it raises an alert. It can be paired with intrusion prevention system that based on alerts does something about it. But I've, in practice, most of the time there's a human on the other end that receives the alert and acts upon it. There are two main ways of doing this, broadly classified. They're called misuse-based and behavior-based. If we look uh, mostly uh, first at the misuse-based, uh, misuse-based IDS focuses on blacklisting negative behavior. So they say, 
in my network, I don't want people who, uh, sorry, actions that are like this. I don't want IPs from this range. I don't want packets which contain this. You set up your large set of rules, deploy it on, an, on a central machine, a monitor, a device itself. And whenever a packet comes in that matches the descriptions, you don't allow them. Uh, this is quite intuitive. It's done a lot. It has a lot of advantages, but obviously some disadvantages, which is it's hard to it's hard to know part of the system is deployed what the attacks will be. So then, for we have a different approach. It's called behavior based. This is does not make any assumption about rules. It instead tries to learn what the behavior of the system is supposed to be. This is done using machine learning approaches, and it studies the system behavior to establish a benchmark. It says, this is a normal behavior. Every time we have something different from the normal behavior, it is an anomaly. Or on the other hand, if we study the system behavior under attack, we're doing penetration testing, we know what the attacks look like on a specific system and therefore can detect them. Both of them are quite uh, valid approaches. They both have downsides. And what I wanted to do in a very large search literature, I want to establish, okay, so I know these are the main ways of that, yes, However, given the specific characteristics that I've talked about in the IoT, what are our options for an IDS for the IoT? Are there any differences? Can I just take an IDS from a traditional system and implement it? And to do so, I tried to read some literature and try to figure out what's going on. And what I couldn't find was an executive summary that told me, if you want to do this, do that. This is the advantage of using this approach in this circumstances. This is what we've currently done. So I went ahead and did this myself. I started reading and I wanted to know what work is being done in the area. My intent was to figure out what I could do and to establish what the interesting research topics were. So I started reading and I set myself a timeline between 2008 and 2018. Uh, this is, I thought, 10 years was a good enough uh, time span. Well, 10 years because I started in 2018. Um, good enough time span to cover quite a large bit of the area. In 2008 is when the word IoT started popping about and would become quite popular. And I thought 10 years. I can see what's being done and what the current gaps are. So I started picking up papers and to my surprise, there were quite a few. And you know, I started encountering them and reading and I found 54 unique IDS papers for IoT. And this was shocking to me. I did not expect to find so many. I thought that whilst there were some extra constraints on these devices that might need some tweaking of the traditional approaches that would only be have a couple of papers. But uh, despite intrusion detection being a really active area since the 90s and still active today, apparently we need some unique approaches to IoT that I wasn't aware of and 54 authors felt the need to develop something unique. So I went, okay, let's take these papers and organize them. So I did just that. Uh, I'm going to have some premise. So some papers were focusing on very specific scenarios. So smart grades, smart home, healthcare. So these are scenarios that require specific setups and therefore it made sense for a new paper to be done on you. Know, we don't really have this issue with smart home before, so we came at a DS that does specific for that. And okay, that makes sense. Out of all these papers, I didn't find a single paper that said we have less than 85, 90% accuracy, which was interesting. If we have such high accuracy, why are we all repeating the same work? Uh, there was no real consensus on how to evaluate them. Some use trace-based evaluation. So trace-based evaluation is when you take a data set, you train your IDS on the data set, and then you train it on a, use the training data, then use testing data and check the usual machine learning approach of accuracy, precision, F1 scores, low false positive, low false negatives, all the good stuff. And some others implemented on a real system. Some went the extra mile and checked the robustness. Well, some, I say one maybe. And one other thing that I observed, you think that with all these papers, there'd be a lot of inter-paper comparisons. There were none. I think three papers actually compared the results to some other thing. And this was sh shocking to me because I expected that if we're proposing a new IDS, we first compare it to another IDS and establish ours is better or does something unique. And so what I tried to reason about and learn is that in these systems, in the IoT specifically, which is different in the system, is we need to focus a little bit more on other types of evaluation. Uh, why is this? So whilst precision is very useful, in these systems, you have highly dynamic behaviors. Devices might change, devices go offline for a long time, etc. So actually being able to adapt to new behaviors is a very important metric, which needs to be observed. 
And the precision, uh, sorry, single precision is not as important as much as the ability for the IDS to work in different environments. There is also some, uh, on the same line, there is an issue with robustness. Can an IDS train on one system work in another system? And so I wanted to find out if this was explored because I thought this was very important metrics. And so we went through and actually looked at it. So I'm gonna break down by attacks, deployment type techniques, and then um, and different evaluation. And then focus a lot on techniques for doing intrusion detection because that was kind of the more interesting thing. So first of all, out of these 54 papers, they focus on 14 unique attacks, which are summarized here to the left. Um, this was unsurprising. The way we deploy these systems leaves them vulnerable to a wide array of new attacks that might not be tra exist in traditional system. This is in part due to the constraint of these devices that require new technologies to be pushed forward, such as new protocol and new encryption, new cryptography. And whenever you bring on new protocols, new software, new ways of operating, so come new attacks and so a lot of ideas are focusing only on this. So 20% focused on routing attacks. Uh, so these are kind of attacks that aim to exploit the way messages are sent through the system, such as black hole, sinkhole, civil attacks. If you've read into this area, you've probably read a lot about these attacks. The idea is that as a device in a large geographical IoT network, I'm not simply able to send from my, my, my um, messages from A to B, I need to route it through a series of other devices to eventually get the message destination. This means that if you take over one of these devices, you're able to reroute attacks and make sure the attacks don't get delivered or that, uh, the, that the throughput of the system goes down, that resources are depleted from the devices sending multiple messages when they don't need to. And this made a lot of sense because it's kind of attacks that rose a lot in popularity with the advancements in wireless sensor networks and IoT. And so it made sense of a lot of work focusing on this. The second hugely popular defense mechanism was DOS attacks. Uh, this is a new angle of attack on these kind of systems. So IoT devices may often be powered by battery. So it becomes a very easy attack to attempt to drain this battery by continuously spamming messages. Uh, also, they have constrained capabilities. So while it might be difficult to spam a server or to DOS a server because it's got a lot of computing power, to DOS some devices in a network becomes quite easy. Oh, and furthermore, it becomes very easy to actually acquire botnets these days. I can buy a huge botnet on the dark web for hundred pounds and DOS whatever I want. So this becomes another reason why DOS is something we need to defend against. And was it is quite easy to maybe detect the DOS on a single device because you can have rate limiting, etc. When a DOS attack is happening across a large network, it becomes more difficult and tricky, especially if you have imperfect information, which is one of the big areas of interest when you're deploying an IDS in this system. And then finally, there were very few, a lot of protocols based attacks. Again, this is an outcome of new protocols being proposed. As we are from the verification, what we are very aware, whenever a new protocol is proposed, it's hated for the verification because no one verifies their protocol prior to proposing them. And of course, that means that we need to defend the system as the protocols take ages to patch. So this made sense with a lot of attacks and it was in line with our hypothesis. However, what we did observe was that the very, very few detection focusing on protocols, such as uh, state-based intrusion uh, detection, which is specific for protocol-based attacks, despite the large amount of papers focusing on this as a threat. So then the second thing we looked at is where are these IoT IDSs being deployed? So there were 15 unique deployment scenarios. This was something we expected. There are new protocols, new technologies. You know, we have smart cities. We have BACnet, which is a protocol to integrate, uh, for managing smart buildings. We have e-healthcare is rising in popularity. And so it made sense. There were a lot of papers specifically looking for these deployments. Now, by no means do I make the claim that we couldn't use a traditional approach on a smart cities and work just as well. However, these bespoke solutions claim to provide a solution that will work in this. Of course, it is not evaluated, so we take it with a pinch of salt. Another thing that was a, a bit odd to me, um, there were four general IoT IDS solutions. 
so when you make the claim that you're an IoT IDS, in my opinion, at this point, you cannot really say that you are looking at a specific scenario. You are saying that you'd work on multiple IoT deployments, and therefore you should probably evaluate for adaptivity, robustness, and different scenarios. But this was not done. Uh, this was not many means uh, critique. It is very difficult to have availability to a test bed that can try different scenarios. Data sets are very scarce. I just found it interesting that there were 14 papers on IoT. However, none of them shared solutions. Right? To explain their claims very well, saying yes, we would, or even theoretically explain yes, we work on this IoT setup. But if you switch this, we'd still work. Following IoT, there's W wireless sensor networks. Now, wireless sensor network were a technology very popular just prior to the rise of the IoT. Very active research area there, and they have some. Similarities with IoT, mainly their constrained capabilities, their single purpose, but they also have a homogeneity not present in IoT. So what this means is it's much easier to reason about them. So a WSN will be composed of hundreds of devices, which makes it tricky, but all the devices will be the same. So you can actually use a lot of rule-based techniques and misuse detection, which we then see in the technique analysis. Raising area is RPL. RPL is a protocol for routing in lossy networks. This is a relatively new protocol. And this is once again, a protocol designed specifically for IoT systems. It makes sense that people are exploring it. And this is directly associated with the rise in analysis of uh, routing attacks. And it makes sense that since RPL is so vulnerable to routing attacks, there was uh, a pattern between these two things. Then finally, the things we want to look at is, okay, we have an IDS, how do we evaluate it? And this is where I was the most surprised. Uh, 12 authors didn't evaluate their solution. So 12 authors made a claim that they proposed a new IDS for the IoT, but didn't even attempt to implement it, reason about it massively, or in any way test them. So this was something I did not expect. But nevertheless, was the case. Then 24 tools were evaluated using simulators. Uh, these simulators have a lot of advantages over implementing it on your own system. It's much quicker to deploy. You have access to different configurations. You can quickly switch scenarios and see different things. You can check different protocols. So it makes us a lot of sense that uh, it was so popular. And I was actually impressed by the sheer number of simulators available. There were 10 different simulating tools. Uh, Contiki is the, by far the most popular. It is a specific simulator constructed to reason about IOC system interactions. And there was a lot of work focused there. And out of the papers that are using the simulators, almost all of them focused on network detection. Oh yeah, sorry, briefly, uh, I should have mentioned it earlier actually. When I discuss an IDS, an IDS may either be a network IDS, which looks at network packets and has no information about the devices themselves, or very little, and looks at how behaviors of devices communicate to each other. There's a host IDS, which are called HIDS, which is based on the device itself. Uh, this has a lot more insight about what's happening in devices. You might get some traces of the attack, and it's a lot more similar to malware analysis, but it faces some of the same constraints that we see in trying to update devices with solutions because you actually got a place on the device. And finally, CHIDS is a collaborative IDS, which unites network and host-based approaches. So sorry if I didn't explain that earlier about the tables. Um, so, so going back to the network stuff, uh, one of the reasons that uh, network simulators were so popular was in part due to the way these systems are evaluated. Uh, they all check for precision, accuracy, uh, and uh, how well they score on these metrics, which means that they don't care about the impact on the device. They don't really worry too much about performance. So it doesn't really matter if you have an actual implementation. Now, the advantage of implementing in a real system is you get more accurate presentation of how the devices are affected by these attacks rather than a network simulator where you're only looking at the packets. So one of the things that we saw is almost no Tools compared with the other tools. This was surprising. You have 24 tools, 10 different simulators, but at least a few were using the same exact simulator. And you'd expect some interpaper comparison, but only I think four papers out of 54 actually attempted to do that. And even to and 
The final observation about the valuation is although we all talk about the IoT being different than standard systems and we have different constraints, when it comes to valuation, we're still doing the same exact things as we did before, which is just looking at these metrics. But actually, some other authors are actually discussing that we might want to look at a few different properties, such as adaptability, scalability, which is big. Can you actually defend 200 devices instead of just one? And these things were not analyzed at all in the literature. So finally, the most exciting part of our classification was, OK, so we have all these IoT, they're deployed in scenarios, they detect different attacks. But how are they actually trained? How are they deployed? So the uh, proposed approaches were very, very uh, vast. There was a lot of different techniques. It was very interesting to look at the different machine learning approaches and what everybody did. And it was quite interesting because you could really see some machine learning working for very specific scenarios, but that wouldn't really work in more traditional systems. So there was a, a huge rise, for example, in providing clustering based approaches, which I it's quite nice. You cluster you, similar devices, uh, behaviors in a similar bubble. So you can actually see how uh, classify these devices as clusters of different behaviors. Anything that emits a cluster is all of a sudden an attack. This is interesting because actually the device, it only works because the devices are quite simplistic and you can do this quite successfully, which was interesting. I did not see this in my literature review in more traditional system. Anomaly based, uh, I've obviously classed a lot of these more specific things into one approach. There are a lot of different anomaly based approaches, but I classed them all together. It was the most popular. Anomaly based attacks have the, uh, anomaly based IDSs have the advantage that they're able to detect unknown attacks and therefore are very powerful. They, they also bypass the difficulty of having to reason about attacks on a system beforehand. So in signature based, in rule-based, which are actually still very popular, you actually have to set up all the rules and the difficulty of the attack beforehand, and which takes some time, and actually you're probably going to miss some. Once an anomaly, you don't need that. You just say this is the behavior of the system. Well, you learn the behavior of the system and go that. It's often system agnostic. Now, what I mean by that, by all means, I don't actually mean that you can train an anomaly-based attack on one system and put it on another system. This is not what I mean by agnostic. I mean that actually the same technique used for anomaly detection will work on different data sets and different system without too much fine tuning needed. However, one observation I made that was these very machine learning based approaches using anomaly detection, none of them have been implemented on an actual system. This is in part probably due by this being led by the machine learning community rather than the security community maybe. But it was interesting that actually of these 15 or so anomaly detections, none of them actually been tested on a real system live. They've all been done on trace execution, which has some downsides. Uh, computation intelligence is very popular. Uh, this is in part explained by the fact that when I started this review, it was becoming popular in the machine learning world in 2008. It was the year that our artificial immune systems were first proposed in literature and quickly made their way to IDSs, artificial immune system, or machine learning technique, which seeks to learn behaviors kind of like our immune system does, learn about antigen attacks. And actually it was quite interesting application to the IDS because it was able to, the simplicity of these devices allowed to use the technique quite popularly. And that's why there are at least four different papers doing this technique, which is quite shocking because it's not that used in other areas of machine learning. And then the misuse being so popular, rule-based, signature-based, and Specific information based on the answer being very popular and more so than I expected, but this was specific to the WSN systems and the homogenous ones that kind of make it so the downside of this technique are less evident. So this is a big summary. So this is a, a more depth of all the techniques. So at the top you have misuse based, at the bottom you have the behavior based techniques. This, Papers which are highlighted in light blue are hybrid approaches. So they're papers who mix two techniques. Normally, when you mix two techniques, you mix uh, uh, misuse detection and behavior-based detection. This has a lot of advantages. When you do that, you get the advantages of, for the known attacks, you got rules. For the unknown attacks, you can still detect them through the uh, behavior-based. And by putting these two together, you manage to get a lot more coverage. Of course, there are some difficulties in setting it up, but this is effectively a big overview. As you can see, one of the things that was a bit surprising, I actually, 
even though misuse was very popular here at the top, the signature base, which is the behavior based version of the misuse, which is a bit more accurate, only two papers did it. And there was some rise in some interesting techniques, such as automatons and finite state machines, which I've never seen before in more traditional IDSs. But once again, this was an outcome of the subjective design of being able to define in a formal manner, which is always very interesting. And I think a very powerful approach to add more understanding about it. So let's actually look at the misuse based stuff first here at the top. So in practice, when we look at misuse, it has a lot of advantages actually. Uh, at the beginning, I know that researchers particularly don't really look at misuse. It's considered almost a solved area. The reason because that is you set up rules about your system and then you move from there. It's not, it's not super exciting, but it does a lot of things right actually. When, um, so when you get an alert in your system, it's very, very easy for a network administrator to see, okay, this rule has been broken and therefore I know what the hack is. This is immensely useful. I cannot stress it enough how important this is because when you get an anomaly in a machine learning business system, if you don't know what the anomaly is, you will have to spend hours maybe chasing up a potential attack that might not exist, that would cost money. We'll need one person chasing it, which might not be available. And actually has a lot of detriments on your performance it's to the point where it might be better to have a lower accuracy, but more actionability, just because it's cheaper for you to miss an Nmap scan on your system or something and not worry about it, then detect an attack that might be there and then chase it for hours. So, Actionability for misuse detection is great. It's one of the reasons why most commercial IDSs are focused on misuse based, despite most of the research being focused on behavior based. It is quite flexible. Theoretically, if you have a set of rules about a certain protocol or system, you could use the same set of rules with minor alterations on a different system, which is great. And it's relatively scalable. So despite IoT devices having some memory overhead that makes it unfeasible to have a large set of rules, given a central location for this thing, there's a lot of work actually in that aspect of more data optimal data processing, it scales quite well. However, the bad is really bad. Uh, the bad is that we need to have an understanding of the system good enough to have all the set of rules for the attacks, in practice, anybody who's worked in security knows that's not the case. Attacks are, uh, most attacks are unknown. Most attacks are multi-step, so actually cannot be captured easily by a single rule. And finally, it's incredibly easy to bypass them. Misuse detection has been around since even before we started talking Is that my internet or Luca's internet? Where was yep. the last bit? You had the good stuff, you were just yep. starting with the bad stuff. Okay, yep. so effectively the bad stuff is that it's very easy to bypass. Even just slight changes in the network packet can make a misclassification. Uh, it's been an active research area for the hackers to bypass these systems. Misuse based detection has been around since before I was born probably. And so we know fully well that we have one of these systems. Uh, attacker would bypass it. And in practice, most modern attacks are multi-step and cannot be caught by a simple rule. So despite all the good stuff, not good enough for the system or rather not interesting from the point of view of research. This is how the way I look at it. It's not really an area that can have a lot of promise. So then we look at the bottom side, the behavior base. This is where the really exciting stuff where most of the research things is. And it's all about trying to understand the system and understanding what can go wrong in the system so we can then fix it. So what behaviors can we observe? There are two main ways of doing this. The first one being anomaly detection, a very active researcher, even outside of intrusion detection. Uh, 
Uh, an anomaly detection system seeks to establish the good behavior and it flags anything that doesn't match. So we benchmark everything that's happening in the system. Whenever something is happening that we don't expect, we flag it as an anomaly. This is really in, this is really effective on detecting unknown attacks because we don't care if it's an attack or not. It's simply something we do not expect and therefore flag it. This is very powerful. It allows us to have less setup time, less thinking, less analysis, and quite good result because we detect unknown attacks. Of course, there are a lot of more downsides to this approach that we'll discuss shortly. But first, I want to touch on signature-based detection. Now, signature-based detection is in my opinion, something quite interesting and very powerful. It, it is an extension of misuse-based detection in which you don't specify rules of attacks, you actually run attacks on your system or test out vulnerabilities, just exactly like you do in a real software development. You test things, see what goes wrong, and we learn it. This allows us to, using machine learning, to learn the patterns of behavior. This catches multi-step attacks. This catches very, very, very accurate representations of the vulnerabilities that are specific to our system. And it actually learns what attacker looks like. So this was actually an area that I was surprised was so few papers looked at. But in practice, it makes sense because the research here is not about machine learning techniques. It's more about how to effectively uh, attack these systems, evaluate them on a security analysis. And there's a huge overhead in terms of system uptime. You've got to be able to collect large amount of data on your system spoke to your system that you might not want to do if your system is live or it's not super easy to do beforehand. And so this area was, I think it's quite interesting, especially for very specific attacks that you know are vulnerable systems, just routing attacks. It might not be feasible for a large wider scale. So we're stuck with anomaly detection. That's great. It's where the machine learning stuff is, it's where the fun happens. It's all a lot of the research is. Let's look at it in practice. So what is anomaly detection in the IoT, uh, in the IoT network-based intrusion detection? So we have large amounts of data. The classification is anomaly, non anomaly, and we have to identify patterns. At this point, any machine learning people, if you would think, perfect, this is exactly what we need, very easy machine learning problem. This is great. However, what is the problem with this kind of system is there's a huge cost of false negatives, false positives even more, and when things go wrong, things go very wrong, and it costs companies money. So people, all of a sudden, having no explainability of why things go wrong becomes a bit of a downside. So one of the issues that a lot of machine learning people would be familiar with is when a classification is made in a black box machine learning system, we don't know why. Or it's very difficult to go back and trace why the prediction was made to the extent that it's sometimes impossible, especially if we use some very naive approaches. Uh, the problem with anomaly detection is that it is not actionable. So once I get an alert, I'm aware it is an anomaly, but then I have to do my own investigation of figuring out what caused the anomaly, why is this bad, is it actually an attack? The classification is not made, and unfortunately, with the way we can do it with deep neural networks at least, there is no way of explaining things. So of course, there's an XKCD comic, of course, there's an XKCD comic for everything, and so therefore, what people have been trying to do is, OK, so we have anomaly detection, and we think it's really good. It's by far the most promising one. It allows to find unknown attacks. We learn behaviors bespoke to our system. This is all good stuff. How do we make it more white box? So we want to avoid this, this understanding of the system. We want to address the actionability of these predictions. We want to actually be able to take an anomaly and go, OK, this is why it came up and act upon it. So how do we do this? Uh, there's been a rising trend in an area called white box anomaly detection. And by no means do I know the result of this. Actually, it's there is no silver bullet. Some people have been proposing using more understandable machine learning techniques, such as boosting and tree-based approaches. They allow to have some intuition about what rules are broken, even though they're not very human interpretable in my experience. There's a lot of work on trying to understand the data, customize it, actually process it in a way that features are very explaining. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the black box approach doesn't do that. There is a lot of work trying to actually add semantics to the data from the system. And that's very interesting, but you know, there's always a case of overfitting or difficulty in exactly what that means. And there's no easy approach to do that. And what we're trying to do effectively with white box anomaly detection is we're switching the problem on its head. It's no longer about 
anomaly detection and machine learning, it's how do we reason about these systems? How do we embed the knowledge we have about the system to the machine learning, more importantly to the prediction, so we can go back from the prediction to understanding what's happening in our system. So as a summary of this first bit about the paper analysis, we reviewed 51 papers. Our initial goal was to evaluate all of them in a unified test bed, very ambitious. And we emailed all 84 authors, one replied. Uh, the one that replied provided their code and it was a simulation based thing. So we weren't able to evaluate it anyway in our environment, but at least it was actually quite good. We were able to look at it and run it. Uh, four out of 51 had GitHubs available that I was able to find. All of these were network simulator based. Uh, the rest had no code whatsoever to be seen. This was quite a worrying trend and it sort of explained to me why we keep building new IDSs. Uh, if I can't start from an existing one and add a few tweaks here and there to cater to a specific problem, I have by the definition have to make a new paper and I can't evaluate it with the other papers. That's why we had no interpaper ability. And of course, there are some specific scenarios, some environments. Not everybody has access to a test bed at home. So it makes sense of the simulation, but at the same time, why don't we share those simulation data? And one of the things we briefly investigated before uh, giving up on it due to not having lost access to my lab and COVID, uh, we wanted to actually come up with a way to address some of these issues with the uh, Evaluability, and we wanted to actually build a test that, that could be flexible enough to test different IoT setups, could easily be redeployed, etc. And the way we proposed doing this, we started doing this, was using virtualization. So we created a hypervisor with could quickly spawn machines, build tra net realistic network traffic, and actually deploy IDS on top of this. This unfortunately never came to be, but in it has a lot of advantages, as in you're able to check the behavior and impact on the devices while still being able to be flexible enough to look at different configurations. And I know there's some work here at uh, Edinburgh actually doing something similar with Docker. So I'm very looking forward to looking at more of that later in the future. But anyway, this was a summary of the survey. So let's quickly look, at, let's review our options. What are we left with in terms of actually interesting research that could be done in this area? So to the very right, we have misuse based. Uh, a lot of advantages, but from the point of view of research, it's easy to circumvent, non-comprehensive and really, the research there can be focused more about how to make it harder to bypass our rules, but there's not that much work. It's a, uh, the other thing that could be done there, sorry, I don't talk about it too much, but one thing that's interesting is automatically generating rules based on behavior from the machine learn, other machine learning approaches. I've seen some work on that, which I thought was quite interesting, but by itself, perhaps not so interesting. So then we look at behavior based. This is more bespoke to the system, gives a more accurate representation of the behaviors, and therefore is more interesting to look at. So like I said, signature-based attacks, interesting, could potentially work quite well for understanding the attacks on the system, but I don't know how realistic it is on large deployment because adaptability is very difficult with this. You have to rerun the attacks. And maybe since we're still limited on the attacks, you know, maybe not so good. So then we're going to anomaly, the big area where here is the most work that can be done. And the two main techniques, black box and white box. I believe that whilst black box approaches will, by definition, the way I would train them, not by definition, but how we do them will always give us a high level of accuracy and precision. They have little value in actually being deployed as an IDS in practice because of the lack of accessibility, because of the lack of understanding. So whilst I think there is lots of research to be done there, exploring new techniques, it will not go anywhere in terms of actual implementation unless we start understanding what's going on in the prediction, which leads us to white box prediction, uh, anomaly detection. And this having the advantages of bespoke behavior analysis, having the advantages of really high accuracy and all the machine learning things with the added advantage of we're able to understand our prediction. So, we have established this an exciting research. We're not the old, I'm not by any means the first one to do this. I really encourage anyone who's interested in this area, even outside of the scope of the IoT, to read this paper by Sommer and Paxson, ISMP 2010. It's called Outside the Closed Loop. It actually discusses black box intrusion detection extensively. And what they discuss is that although there's a lot of advantage to it, they effectively summarize all the things I've said uh, way before I did it for the IoT. And what they uh, what they say is that 
there is a dissonance from what we know of the system and the actual prediction. There is this thing they identify as a semantic gap, which doesn't allow us to reason, use the prediction to go back to all the stuff we already know about it and actually use it when we have an anomaly. So we're a bit stuck here. We have a lot of knowledge about these systems. We have information about the topology. We have information about protocols. We might even have threat assessments, but there is an inability to translate that to from the prediction to this information. So a lot of people, when they hear semantic gap, they think, oh, more actionable machine learning. They think we want to uh, come up with new data analysis, et cetera. Now, that's not the world I come from. When I hear semantics, I think of the semantics. So uh, modeling has a lot of advantages, as in it allows us to abstract core characteristics of systems in reason about specific scenarios. This is a very well studied area. We've been doing performance evaluation and security analysis of system using models for a very, very long time. It allows us to reason about the system, detect attacks. It's been successfully used to run a security evaluation for a variety of systems. And so I thought, why can't we use this to understand this machine learning, to reason about this system, takes all the information we have and help us understand our machine learning predictions. So, there are some caveats to this. Uh, the, we wanted to have realistic attackers. So we wanted to have trace semantics that were able to capture realistic attacker behaviors, not just a, the trick with this was we were risking getting stuck in defining the attack as a set of steps, just like the rule-based approaches, the particular-based approaches, and not actually getting realistic behavior. So instead of focusing on this, we set out attack objectives for which the attacker could uh, find optimum ways to drain the devices using battery. And to actually calculate the battery drain, we set up an experiment in our lab where we use voltmeters and precise battery calculations to actually check on the impact of battery drain of actions in the system and actually check the impact of communication on the device themselves. So we actually had an extra layer of knowledge that wouldn't be available in a traditional data set when you do trace evaluation to understand actually what's going on. So an anomaly might not be an attack. It might actually be your device is draining too much battery. You want to route the networks differently. So we reason about these systems using market decision processes and police control tree logic. The way it allowed us to do is to optimize for the least damaging behaviors and reason about this. It also gave us the ability to have bespoke information about the systems. We could have an ideas deployed for this. And we applied this to the machine learning algorithms to actually see what's going on with the prediction. Uh, this provides quite successful. We were able to run in a variety of scenarios. We had a bit of issues, of course, with uh, scalability. It's a known issue with modeling is that whilst it's able to reason about this very effectively, we couldn't scale to very, very large devices, but actually it was quite successful with some small devices and some systems and a variety of attacks. It also had the extra layer that we're able to reason about multi-step attacks such as DOS, because we could easily look at it through the system and routing attacks, which was very specific. When we look back at our survey, those, the DOS attacks and the routing attack composed over 33% of the system attacks, which is quite interesting. And so we thought, actually, this is really cool. We can reason about the systems, we can do the formal evaluation on them, can we actually do this from the other side as well? So what we explore, so the first approach would be more like a signature-based approach with some variability just use probabilism that allows us to get a bit more than just predefined rules, but it's still fixed off. Can we actually take the network capture, the packets, the traces in the system, and actually reason to them about them in a trace-like manner? So we can easily see if that act's going on because we have the full system traces. So what we did there in an initial investigation of anomaly detection is we, instead of using the traces from the large system as the to go along the machine learning algorithm, we actually reason about the behaviors in the network as transitions, run evaluation, we can actually check them to expected behaviors and make comparisons there. For this paper, we looked at a specific optimization criteria. Uh, optimization focuses on looking at the best possible behaviors. And the idea for this was that in IoT, where devices are so constrained, sometimes optimizing routing is the best way of going to it. And so we're able to detect any anomalies, anything that was suboptimal. Now I realize my time is over. 
So I'm just going to stop my presentation here. I'm happy to talk some more on any of these aspects later, or if you have, people have any questions. But I'm, I'm wary that people have to go, so I'll just stop right here.